Hi. Some people are out standing in their fields, but I'm out standing in the woods in back of my shop. And today we have a little quickie that's all about uh, calipers and vernier scales. But before we head down to the shop, I'd like to thank Herb Blair, who lives down in Texas, Colin over at Comp Edge X, and David Aaron, who all showed concern over my well-being. Uh, I'd just like to say, uh, the shaking comment, everything's under control, and my eyesight, well, it's doing just fine. So don't worry, but thank you for your concern. I would also like to thank Pierre Baudry and M. V. Ray for great comments and questions about the micrometer videos. Uh, great questions and comments that brought on, in part, the subject of the day, which is my vernier scales. So. Thanks for those questions, and because of those questions, this little quickie is for you. So, let's head down to the shop and take a look at calipers and vernier scales. Hi. Calipers, they really are amazingly versatile measuring tools, but they do have their limitations. But one of their limitations isn't versatility. Uh, first we have digital or vernier scale. And once we have those two types, we can also add to that dial calipers. But that's just a method of reading. What they can actually do is outside measurements, inside measurements, depth measurements, two ways, on this end, and from a shoulder on this end here. So as I've said, these are incredibly versatile tools, but they do have their limitations. Now these are accurate tools. They're just not incredibly accurate tools. Now, as I said in the micrometer video, they're long and they're flexible and they slide, they have a sliding movement, which has to, by definition, incorporate some play. So I wouldn't bargain or bet on these within a thousandths of an inch. Two thousandths of an inch, if properly manipulated, well, that's quite possible. And as a general rule for everyday work, plus or minus three to five thou is no problem whatsoever. And that really isn't a problem, because what we use these for is our preliminary rough measurements. Or, if the part we're making isn't particularly accurate, well, the whole job can be done with a good pair of calipers. Well, what exactly does that mean? Accurate, but not terribly accurate. I have to admit that most people starting out in this trade, and many young designers, have what I call tolerance on the brain. And that is the tendency to over-tolerance everything. It comes from the insecurity that we have when we're starting out. Now, if I make something incredibly accurately, well, I can't be faulted if something goes wrong. When in reality, over-tolerancing, making a part too accurate for what it's for, only raises the price of the part and really isn't an efficient way of working. And that means that for many, many parts that we make, plus or minus three to five thousandths of an inch is more than accurate enough. You have to remember, especially those who still have some, that three thousandths of an inch is about the thickness of a person's hair and that is if they have thick hair. So three thousandths really isn't that much. And for most of our applications, most of the jobs that we're gonna to wanna to do, that is more than accurate enough. And that means that this very versatile and quite accurate tool can do the job for most of the work that we need to perform. And when we do something very accurately, well then, we break out those micrometers or those comparative tools. But even 
when I'm making something incredibly accurate that's going to be using micrometers or even more accurate measuring tools. Well, that part has to start somewhere. We don't go from nothing to extremely accurate in one foul swoop. So that means that we have to rough the part out and gradually bring it closer to the level of precision that we want. And that means that for 90% of most projects, even the very accurate ones, these calipers will do the job very well, thank you. As an example, remember a 1-2-3 block. Now, when you make a 1-2-3 block, you have to rough square the part up, bring it down to its uh, pre-heat treatment dimensions, and then you have to go and grind it to its final dimensions and square everything up perfectly. Well, really, all the roughing and, and all that preliminary work can be measured with the calipers. And even once it's heat treated, you can still use the calipers until you get down to those last few thousandths of an inch in the grinding room. And that's when you're going to break out the micrometers. So as you can see, even with very accurate work, these tools can be of service. So in my little home shop here, I have four different vernier calipers. So let's take a minute to look at them in a little more detail. Let's start by taking a look at these two six inch models, one with vernier scale and one that has the digital scale. These two basic shop tools are almost a must have. Now one or the other, you don't need both. Uh, but depending on what you choose, it may have to do with what one does better than the other. And each one has its little advantage. The vernier scale one, its main advantage, since it does all the same measurements, but its main advantage is that it's ready to roll. I mean, there's no batteries here. This thing is always good to go. And that is a big advantage for someone like me who doesn't uh, pay much attention to things like buying batteries. Okay, so that's a good advantage for this one. And what I like about this electronic one is that it can be reset to zero in any position. And if you're going to be comparing measurements in a plus or minus way, well, that's a real advantage. So let's take a look at that. Let's say I'd like to compare these two uh, one, two, three blocks in a plus or minus deviation way. Well, I can position my calipers to zero on my reference block and then compare in a plus or minus way. I can see that they're pretty close here, about five tenths, which isn't really in the range of what this tool can measure. So I'm, I'm close here, but I can measure in a plus or minus way a large number of parts and compare them to my base part. And that's something that's really nice with this electronic caliper. And as I've said, both do about the same thing. They can do outside measurements as well as inside measurements and also depth measurements. Two ways, this way and with the shoulder depth measurement. So as I said, from zero to six inches, four different types of measurements. This is a very versatile tool. And I also have these two longer models, this very ancient or 60 year old ancient uh, Starit model that has a double sided scale, one side for outside measurements and one side for inside measurements. And this more modern single sided scale, but metric and imperial, a 12 inch uh, caliper and its vernier scale is quite long, nicely spread out, easy to read compared to these older versions that were made for people who had terrific eyesight or were used invariably with these monocles because the scale is so small that it's very difficult to read. So this newer one is quite easy to read, but it has only metric and imperial on one side. There's no side for inside, one side for outside measurements. And that means that once you take your measurement, if you're doing an inside measurement, well, you have to subtract the width of the little tangs at the end here, 
and in this case, in the imperial ones, well, you'd add 0.3 inches width to your measurement, and that will give you their inside measurement. In a few minutes, we're going to look at how to read this vernier caliper. Why this one? Well, it has quite a large and easily read scale. The lines are quite distinct, and that makes it easy to show on the camera. So, and it also has metric and imperial on the same one. So we're going to use this one as our example. But you may have noticed that vernier scales vary quite a bit in length, in number of divisions, and all that. And that means that each one has to be read differently. Not true. They all work the same way. And a good way of learning how to read any vernier scale would be to learn how to make your own vernier scale. So let's head over to the whiteboard and look at how vernier scales work and how you can make one up on your own. After that, you can figure out any vernier scale that you'll ever meet. Here I've made up two scales, one short, one long, and they serve the same purpose <coughs> as the scales on my uh, caliper here. One short scale, that is the vernier scale, and one long scale, that's the fixed scale. Now, this isn't in inches, this isn't in millimeters, it's just an example. So what I've done is I've taken my long scale and I've divided it into nine equal sections. And I've created a vernier scale that represents three portions of the bottom scale or the fixed scale. So if I look at my vernier scale, I'll see that it is of the same length as three divisions on my fixed scale. Now, for a vernier scale to work, we need two things. The first is that the start and the finish of the vernier scale has to concur with lines on the fixed scale. Not always, but once drawn, it has to be able to do that. And if I look here, I've aligned the zero on the vernier scale with the zero on the fixed scale. And when I do that, I notice that the last line on the vernier scale concurs with a line on the fixed scale. Which line is not important? A line. So I have a concurrence between the two scales on the limits of the vernier scale. The second thing of importance is to have a different number of divisions in that same distance. And not just any different number of divisions, but a difference of one. Let's take a look. We have our three divisions on our main scale that are exactly the same distance as four dimensions on our vernier scale. And that means that other when than when the first and last line up, if I place it any other way, there will only ever be one line at a time that aligns between the two scales. So, let's take a look at how this one quarter uh, division vernier scale works. Let's pretend this is the depth portion of a vernier caliper, and this is my quarter vernier scale. Now, on zero, my zero lines are aligning, the ends of the tool align as well. I am at zero. Now, if I move the tool over to the right, the vernier scale, so that my 25 line lines up with any line down here, in this case the one, I notice at the end that my measuring surfaces have backed off by one quarter of a division. If I put my 0.5 division aligned, I see that I have half of a division movement. Three quarters lines up, three quarters of a division. I'm back on my two end divisions and that means that I have one full space of opening on my tool. Now if I go past that, let's say I'll go to the next 25, well now I have one full division plus a bit. One full plus 25. One full division plus 50. And that's how we read it.
And if you want to read any Bernier scale, all you have to do is follow those two steps. The first step is to read your fixed scale from its zero right up to the zero on the Vernier scale. Read all the full divisions that you can see on that fixed scale. No partial divisions, just the full divisions. Then you go over to the Vernier scale and you look for a line on the Vernier scale that aligns with any line on the fixed scale. Once you find that line on the Vernier scale, you look at the value of the line and you add that value to your first reading of the fixed scale. You add those two values up and you have your dimension. So let's take a look at this example here. Now, first thing is to read the fixed scale from its zero right up to the zero on the Vernier scale. And I can see here that I have one and two, but not three full divisions. So one and two. So I'll note that down as my first reading. Then I want to move up to my Vernier scale. So I go up here and I see that it's the 0.75 line that aligns with a line on the fixed scale. So I'll add to my original reading of 2 the value of the line that lines up, which is 0.75. So this reading, and it's not in inches or in millimeters or in, in whatever, it's just divisions, this reading is 2.75 uh, divisions. So it is just that simple. I read the fixed scale, all its full divisions, then I add to that reading what I can see on the Vernier scale. Let's go take a look at a real caliper uh, and make some readings off of a real Vernier scale. Let's start by looking at the imperial side. And the first thing you want to do is determine the divisions on the fixed scale. This caliper has inch divisions, tenth of an inch divisions, and fifty thousandths of an inch divisions. And that means that each division on this imperial fixed scale represents fifty thousandths of an inch. And that means that my vernier scale is going to represent fifty thousandths of an inch because it's the stretched out version of the smallest division on the fixed scale. And that's why this caliper's vernier scale has 50 divisions, each representing one thousandths of an inch. If we want to read this caliper's vernier scale, we first have to read all the divisions on the fixed scale from the fixed scale's zero right up to the zero on the vernier scale. In this case, I can see 2.2 inches on the fixed scale. I also note that the zero of the vernier scale aligns perfectly with that 2.2 inch line on the fixed scale. Since the next step in reading a vernier caliper is to add to the first reading, the reading of the fixed scale, the value of the line of the vernier scale that aligns with any line on the fixed scale, well we can see that in this case we have 2.2 inches plus 0 0.000 inches indicated on the vernier scale. End result is 2 inches 200,000. And yes, as we've seen in the part one of the metrology video, the trailing zeros are important since they indicate that this measurement was taken with an accurate tool. Had I measured with a vernier micrometer, I would have gone to four decimals. Had I measured with a steel ruler, I would have stayed at two. Let's make another reading. And as we did in the first case, we start by reading the fixed scale from its zero right up to the zero on the vernier scale. And in this case, we can see three complete inches we can see 3.6 inches and ultimately we can see 3.65 inches 3 inches 650 thousandths so let's write that down now we want to determine which line of the vernier scale lines up best with any line of the fixed scale 
then we're going to find the value of that line on the vernier scale and add that value to the number that I found on my fixed scale. I can see here that the 17th line of the vernier scale seems to line up perfectly. So since each line of the vernier scale is worth one thousandth of an inch, we will add 17 thousandths of an inch to the reading that I obtained on my fixed scale, which was 3 inches 650 thou. Now adding those two together, we end up with 3 inches and 667 thousandths. Let's take a look at a metric reading. If I look at the metric scale, the one at the top, I can see that the fixed scale gives me 64 divisions. Each division on this metric fixed scale is worth 1 millimeter. So the reading of the fixed scale in this example is 64 millimeters. Now I can see that the zero on the vernier scale is a little past the line 64. So that means that I'll have to go take a look at the vernier scale and add to this first reading the value of the line on the vernier scale that lines up with any line on the fixed scale. I can see here that it looks like the point 0.3 line of the vernier scale aligns with the line on the fixed scale. So that would mean that I will add 0.3 millimeters to my first reading of 64 millimeters. And that will give me 64.3 millimeters. And yes, here again, the trailing zeros are important. This is a reasonably accurate measurement. So we want two decimals in metric. You also have to be very careful with the metric vernier scales because quite often the smallest division on the vernier scale represents two one hundredths of a millimeter. In our last example, the 0.3 line on the vernier scale lined up, but let's imagine it was the line after the 0.3 line of the vernier scale. Well, that would have given us 0.32 millimeters and not 0.31. Now, for internal measurements, we have different types of setups that you have to watch out for. With this basic 6-inch type caliper, we can see that we have offset contact points for the inside measurements. And that means that the contact points for the uh, outside or inside measurements use the same scale that start on the same zero. If we take a look at this older Styrit model, we can see that our outside measurements here start on zero, but that our inside measurements have a certain thickness on their contact points that we're going to have to account for. With this model, it's not a big problem, because if I flip it over, I can see that I have a second scale for outside dimensions that starts at 0.3. So this second scale already adds the width of the contact points for internal measurements. And finally, the one that we've been using for our reading examples, well, this Mitutoyo model, it has two scales, one uh, metric, one imperial, as we've seen, but it has no back scale. So that means that when we measure outside dimensions, my scale zero is good, it applies. But when I measure internal, I'm going to have to add to all my dimensions 0.3 inches in imperial and 0.76 or sorry 7.62 millimeters in metric. Watch out for that. You also have to remember that these tools are flexible and that they slide. So if you have adjustments on your slide, well keep them nice and snug. But I'm sure that even if you don't have adjustments, that you do have a lock. And that lock can give you a little snugness. Now, you don't want it locked every time you move the tool. But when you are measuring, just when you come to get that final measurement, it's not a bad idea to just snug up slightly the lock to get some friction. And that will help to keep your measurements accurate. Also, your contacts are quite long, especially for the outside dimension contacts here. When possible, avoid using the very tips. Try and use the heels.
and get a good contact between the tool and the part. Remember, this tool will only give you a proper measurement if it's very perpendicular to the surface that you're measuring in both planes. So keep that in mind. These can be pretty accurate tools, but you have to manipulate them with care. Now, I know that we will be tempted to say, well, we're in the modern times and uh, really digital is the way to go. And I must agree that it is a lot simpler and easier to use. But there are a lot of tools out there. And as long as we limit ourselves to the 6 inch or sometimes the 8 inch, we can find uh, electronic uh, calipers, uh, digital calipers readily. But when we get into the longer 12 inch, 18 inch, 24 inch, they're hard to find and they become incredibly expensive. I mean, the normally uh, scaled ones are expensive and the, the digital ones are even more expensive. But what's nice is there's a lot of these older tools out there that you can buy in swap meets or, or, or garage sales or, or whatnot and get them relatively cheap. And if you're at ease with reading uh, vernier scales, well, you can get some pretty good deals for the home shop. And there's one other tool that uses uh, vernier scales, uh, linear vernier scales, that doesn't come cheap if you decide to go uh, digital. And that's your vernier height gauge and you can get these very cheap uh, second-hand uh, vernier scale ones but really the digital ones are quite expensive so this too is a good reason to get used to reading vernier scales now just remember though it's not the end of the world these are accurate measuring tools but if you have to get very accurate you know within one thousandth of an inch with a lot of assurance well, really, you're going to have to go towards your mics. But for your everyday measurements, or even for roughing very accurate parts, these are terrific tools. So, be safe, have fun, and to everyone, happy machining.